In this section of the course, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into engine theory and looking at the theory of why, how engines work and what's going on in there. Specifically, we're going to look at engine thermodynamics. Now, that term thermodynamics can scare people, and we're not going to dig real deep into a lot of the theory, but we need to understand enough of that theory to really get a handle on what's going on inside the engine, to really understand what's happening with efficiencies and things like that in the engine. So that's why we're going to dive into this, and we'll show the relevance of why we need to care about all this stuff. So the way we're going to attack this is, first of all, we're going to look at just the pressure in the chamber, in that combustion chamber above the piston, and we're going to track that and see what that curve looks like and see then why that curve is relevant to us. Then we're going to look at how do we, the modification that we make in the engines, how do they affect that curve? So a lot of things that we've already talked about with lengthening or shortening connecting rods or, or changing, shaving the heads and changing the clearance volume, those kind of things. What are they actually doing inside of that engine to the pressures and the amount of power that we get out of it? So that's what we'll tear into there. And then finally, we're going to look at some real performance, what, what really is happening in there, the difference from the theory to the reality, but then also looking at the efficiency of the engine and start putting some numbers on how efficient or inefficient internal combustion engines are. So let's start first off with looking at the pressure in the chamber. So what I've got here is uh, just a sketch of a, of a piston. And you can see that I have shown this piston in two different positions. Here on the left, the crankshaft and the connecting rod are all in line. They're all stretched out. The piston is up way high. So this is where the piston is at top dead center. So that's the TDC position, top dead center. The, over on the right, the drawing is showing that piston all the way down. So you can see that the crankshaft and the connecting rod overlap. So the crankshaft is all the way down. It's pulled this piston down as far as it can go. So this is obviously at bottom dead center. This is as low as it can go. And what we're interested in is what about the area? What's going on in this area above the piston? What's happening here? So whether it's at top dead center, bottom dead center, or anywhere in between, what's happening in this space up above the piston? That's what I'm trying to get my, my head wrapped around and to start to quantify, put numbers on it, because this is important. And you see I've got the makings of a graph over here on the left. So we're going to make a graph. We're going to plot on the x-axis down here. We're going to plot the volume of gases or whatever is above that piston. So this is volume that we're going to plot on the x-axis. So how much volume is in this space up above there? And we've already looked at that. So we've talked about the displacement of the engine. We've talked about the clearance volume. And the total volume is the displacement plus the clearance volume. So we've seen all those numbers. And we're already there. But now we're going to plot this thing on this, on this graph. So that's what's going to be on the x-axis, volume. And that could be in units of cubic inches or cubic centimeters or something like that. On the y-axis now, we're going to we're going to plot the pressure. I'll put a capital P up there. So this is going to be the pressure inside there. Again, pretending that somebody put a pressure sensor inside that chamber and just measuring how much pressure is in there. What is the pressure? What does it look like? So those are the things that we're going to plot and what we're going to look at. Now, a couple things I want to put on this graph. We can already start to put some numbers or some limits on this graph. Because you think about the volume, the volume above the piston changes as the piston moves. So as the piston goes up to the top, the volume goes down. So I have a very low volume. So when it's clear up the top, the volume that I have up there is my clearance volume. That's all that's left. When it's down at the bottom, that's at my maximum volume. So that's my clearance volume plus my displacement over here. But it goes back and forth. So the piston goes from the minimum volume up here down to the maximum volume. Minimum volume, maximum volume, minimum volume, maximum volume. So it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So what does that look like on this graph? My volume is going from the maximum volume to the minimum volume. Maximum volume, minimum volume. So my volume up above that piston goes back and forth. Every time that piston goes up and down, my volume goes up or down. Okay, and in the opposite direction, piston goes up, volume goes down, so they're the opposite. So two different numbers now are limits that we can put on this. So I'll put a tick mark up here, and this is my maximum volume. So this maximum volume occurs at, this occurs at top dead center. 
Okay, that is my volume that I'm going to see. Excuse me, not at top dead center. That's going to be at bottom dead center. So let me erase that so we don't get messed up. So this is at maximum volume happens at bottom dead center. And it's kind of it's backwards, and I got messed up there. So it's bottom dead center. So that's my maximum volume at bottom dead center. My minimum volume is going to happen at top dead center. So it's going to be down here somewhere. So this is going to be at my top dead center. So I'm going to see that volume at that top dead center. And I'll actually put some vertical lines on here so that we can, can put those limits or put those bounds on that piston on that volume where it goes back and forth. So this volume up here is my maximum volume. So I'll just put max down here. And again, that max is equal to the maximum volume is my clearance plus my displacement volume that we've calculated before. So we've done that. That's my total volume, the maximum volume at its maximum. Down here at the lower side, when we get down to the lower volume, this actually is my clearance volume. So that's all that's left. So the volume above the piston up here is my clearance volume. So if this is zero, so if this axis starts at zero down here, then this is my clearance volume. So that distance, we can think about it this way as well. That distance from there to there is my clearance volume. Okay. So that's important to keep, keep in mind those dimensions and those limits of this graph of what's there. Okay. So that's my volumes. And again, my, my piston goes from the top, my clearance volume, down to the bottom, maximum volume, back up to the top, down to the bottom, back up to the top, down to the bottom, so forth. Okay? It goes back and forth. Now, let's look at what happens to the pressure in there. Let's build this up and think what's happening. So when I'm at the maximum, we're going to start at, we're going to assume that the intake stroke has just happened. We'll talk about it. We'll stick to a four-stroke engine now. And the intake has just happened, so this piston has come all the way down to the bottom. We've pulled the gas into there, so it could either be air in a compression ignition engine or air fuel mixture in the spark ignition engine. But whatever is supposed to be in there is in there. And then we're going to start to compress it. So we're starting on the compression stroke. So that's where we're starting up here. So this is, I'm at maximum volume. How much pressure is in there? And we can debate about that, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more detail about that. But if everything was working really well, and that piston come down, and let's say this is a spark ignition engine, it drew that gas through a carburetor, hopefully the pressure of that gas is pretty close to the atmospheric pressure outside. And we'll say that that's zero for now, so we can talk about absolute and gauge pressure, and we're not going to go into any of that, but let's just say that that is kind of our zero pressure. That's the atmospheric pressure. That's where we start. So we're actually going to start up here. So there's going to be our starting point at zero pressure at my maximum volume. Now, I'm going to compress it. I'm going to go from here to here. What's well, going to happen to the pressure in that, in that chamber? Well, it's going to go up, of course. And what it's going to look like is a curve. So it's going to look like a curve, something like this. So let me try to draw this curve in there as best I can. So it'll look something like that. And it'll go and go and go and go, and the pressure will go. Now, it would keep on going. It would keep doing something like that if I kept going. So it would actually go up and it would be an asymptotic. So if I kept squeezing, kept squeezing, kept squeezing, that pressure and pressure would get higher and higher and higher. My volume would approach zero. So as that piston's getting up higher and higher, my volume is approaching zero. But it can never get there because something's going to give. If I have something in there, the volume can't go to zero because there's stuff occupying the space and that's physics and okay, we won't worry about that. But just understand that that's an asymptote. So that's going to go up. Uh, asymptotically toward that y-axis there. Okay, so that's the pressure. That's what the pressure is going to do. Um, it's going to go up asymptotically like that. But it's going to stop again. Our piston is going from bottom, from bottom dead center over here up to top dead center with my clearance volume, and that's as far as it goes, so it stops there. Okay, so the dark line here is showing what's actually happening in that chamber. Now, what happens at this point? Piston gets all the way to the top, and we can argue about timing and so forth, but somewhere right in there, we're going to ignite the fuel. 
So how do we do that again? Either with the spark from a spark ignition engine or that's where we're going to inject the fuel in the compression ignition engine. So somehow the fuel gets lit. What happens when we light the fuel? What happens to the pressure? Boom! The pressure skyrockets. So it's an ex not an explosion really, but a burning. So that that gas, that fuel burns, and we get a real rapid pressure buildup. So what we'll actually get is a very sharp pressure. So that pressure jumps up really high, really quickly. So we get a, a pressure jump like that. So we go vertically. That's what it's going to look like. Okay. Now what happens is as soon as that pressure goes up, of course, that piston is starting to come back down. As the piston comes down, it moves this way. What's going to happen to that pressure? Well, as that space in there gets bigger and bigger, the pressure is going to go back down. So it started up at a high pressure, but the pressure is going to come down as the piston is going down. But I've got a lot of force pushing on that piston through the power stroke, and it's pushing it down here. So it's going to have a similar shape curve as to the bottom one, but it's going to go something like that. And it'll depend on the engine, depend on the fuel, depend on a lot of things, um, how the fuel is burning and all that, depend on temperatures. But it'll look something like that, okay? So just a, a general shape that, that looks basically something like that, okay? This is what we call, and we, we commonly call this a PV curve, and I'll refer to these as PV curves. And this is a, a very common understanding of how an engine works. Okay, so that's a PV curve. So what does that look like? Let's clean that up. So we drew that in again, compression going up here, pressure goes up, goes to our clearance volume stops. We light the fuel, we get a big pressure jump. Then as the piston comes down, the pressure drops a little bit. Then what happens down here is my exhaust. So this is where I open that exhaust valve, um, let the exhaust out, and that pressure is going to drop back down to atmospheric pressure as that pressure gets relieved and goes out through the exhaust. So that's the stroke, okay? Now you'll see that we really only have the, intake, the compression stroke right here. We have ignition, we have the power stroke, or the expansion stroke coming down here, the power stroke. And then we're just kind of showing this curve going back around. So we ignore for now, we'll come back to it, but we ignore the intake and the whole exhaust stroke. And I'll show you how those come into play in just a minute. All right, so this is what it looks like, okay? These are my cycles again. So clean up the graph here so I don't have so much junk. So this curve goes up here. This is my compression. That's my compression stroke. Then I have ignition happening up here. I light the fuel, so the big pressure drop, big pressure jump is the ignition. That's not really a stroke, but that's what's happening there. That's the ignition. Lighting the fuel, big pressure build up because the fuel is, is lit, is burning, and so I've got this big thermal expansion. And then this stroke coming down on the top is my power stroke. That's where I've got that high pressure that's pushing on the piston that's coming down, all right? Exciting stuff, I know, but why do we care? Let's think about this. Power, all right, what is power? Let's look at these units. Again, this is pressure on the y-axis. This is volume on the x-axis, PV curve. Why do we care? Why did I show you this curve? Whatever, you're a weird engineer, you love graphs. No, watch this, this is really important, okay? Let's look at, if I could calculate the area on this graph, and let's pretend that this curve in here is made up of a bunch of different squares, just little squares or rectangles, you know. What's the size or what's the area of those rectangles? Could I calculate the area of those things? The area, of course, of a rectangle is just the length times the width or width times height or however you want to look at that. So it's one side times the other side. So what units does that look like on here? So if I calculated area on this graph, the area is going to be the vertical side. So what's the vertical side of each one of those squares? That's the pressure. So the area is going to be pressure times what's the horizontal side? That's my volume. Pressure times volume, P times V. Okay. And so what? You're still not telling me why I should care. Let's look at units a little bit. 
What are the units of pressure when I talk about pressure? Pressure is in pounds per square inch, newtons per square meter, or something like that. Generically, pressure is a force, pounds is a force, per unit area, force divided by area, okay? What is area? And in fact, let me just take the area off there. What is area? Area is a length squared. So if I look at fundamental units, the area is a length times a length. Force per unit, you know, pounds per square inch. Square inch is a length times a length, an inch times an inch. So it's fourth force per length squared. What is volume? I multiply it by volume. That's a length times a length times a length. Cubic inches, cubic meters, cubic centimeters, whatever. So that is length cubed, L cubed over one. Now if I do my units canceling that we've talked about all along, I have two lengths in the denominator. I've got three in the numerator, so that denominator cancels two of those off. What am I left with in the numerator is force times a length. Okay, what is that? Force times a length. Pound foot. Pound inch. Newton meter. Sound familiar? Sounds like torque also sounds like energy. So this is energy. Oh man. And we talked about going from energy to power. How do we get from energy to power? We have a force times a length. That's the work or the energy that we are expending, the work that we're doing. To get to power, I need a time. So if I have force times a length divided by time, Newton meter per second, foot pounds per second, that's power. That's how we measure power. So that's power. So if I can get from there to power, with it, we put some timing on that, I can get power. Okay, all that to say why I still don't know why I care, here's the deal. If I look at this curve, and if I could somehow measure the area inside that curve, so between the compression stroke and the, exhaust, the, the power stroke, if I could measure this area that I've crosshatched in there, that would be energy. So the area of that is pressure by volume, which is energy. That's how much energy is expended or has done work on the piston during one cycle, so during one combustion cycle. Now, for time, if I know how fast that engine is running, how many combustion cycles are happening a second, and we've calculated that already, we've looked at that in a homework assignment, oh, man, now I know how much power. So I can look at this curve and say, you know what, the area inside that curve is power. That's where the power comes from, the engine. And here is where we start looking at, oh man, if I want to get more power out of the engine, how do I get more power? I want to make this curve bigger. What can I do to make the curve bigger? Now I start thinking about it. And here's where engineers do a lot of work, is looking at the shape of this curve, looking what happened, how do I modify the engine, how do I improve the engine to make this thing bigger, to get more power out of it, how does changes that I do affect this whole thing? So that's why it's important, the area inside this curve, the area between these things, the area that is surrounded by that cycle, that's the power. That is essentially how much power that I'm getting out of that engine. And I could put numbers on it if I wanted to, um, but that is the power. So that's a key thing that we're going to come back to. So next thing we're going to do is look at that curve and say, how could I, how do engine modifications affect the shape of this curve? And we're going to start seeing, oh, does it increase the power? Does it decrease the power? What's it do? So that's where we're going from here.